Well, good evening. Good to see you back out tonight. Grab your song books and stand. Turn to page 109. Page 109. Send the light. We'll sing all of these. Page 109. There's a call. earlier they're about 28 hours late on the rain and uh, they've been forecasting it all weekend a lot of the kids I know they were angry because we canceled the activity for VBS yesterday and such um, but uh, uh, we don't know what it's going to do that shows that God's in control and only he knows and uh, we're glad that you're here uh, nonetheless and we're going to open with a word of prayer brother James Hudson would you open us as we begin tonight Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. There are several things uh, in your bulletin. I won't mention all of them. I will say uh, thank you to all of those that participated, helped out uh, as far as working and such in our vacation Bible school. I know many of you, uh, you uh, were able to help us with refreshments and prizes and things of that nature. And let me just say all of those things are what make vacation Bible school possible. And uh, we can put together a program and all of those things, but it's a team effort. And uh, I appreciate that. 
we had uh, it was somewhere between 12 and 15 decisions uh, through the week and praise the Lord for that and that's what it's all about is the boys and girls coming hearing the gospel and uh, uh, trusting Christ as Savior and we'll be sure to follow up with those and try to get into the homes you be praying about that and I uh, just want to say thank you to that uh, and uh, for making Vacation Bible School a success and then uh, let me remind you about the promotion Sunday you saw that in the bulletin this morning and I do want to say that all of the classes uh, will meet right here in the auditorium next Sunday morning okay uh, for promotion Sunday and uh, then we'll dismiss from here so when you show up next week don't go to your respective class come here we'll uh, we'll give out certificates and things of that nature and then uh, we will uh, dismiss from here and so be uh, be thinking towards that and make sure that you're in your place and then teenagers uh, uh, that are going into uh, the teen department there will be a special activity for you uh, next Sunday night, and uh, you can uh, see Brother Hewitt if you have any questions about that uh, for you and your families, actually. And uh, so uh, make sure that you see Brother Hewitt if you have questions about that. There's several other things uh, in your bulletin. There's a teen rally coming up and teen service and some deacons meetings and things of that nature. And so uh, please make sure that you pay attention to that and uh, that you're where you're supposed to be. Amen. Be in prayer for the pastor and his family, uh, as Brother Hewitt mentioned this morning. They are in Ohio. Actually, they're probably not anymore. Uh, they were in Ohio for uh, for his parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. They're traveling back now. And so pray for them. Uh, the Lord give them traveling mercies. They're supposed to be back in late tonight. But uh, nonetheless, we appreciate you being a part of the service. And we're going to sing another song. You can remain seated. Turn page 34. Page 34, Living by Faith. Missionary of the week this week is uh, Zach Gerwitz to Brazil, and the name may sound familiar to you if you were here a few weeks ago. Him and his family were in uh, uh, Wednesday evening service just a few weeks ago, and um, they have tra in the letter, which obviously he, obviously he gave us a lot of that uh, stuff when he was here last. But in his letter, um, he states that they had transitioned to furlough, and they'll be on furlough for for a little while. And um, he praises the Lord because all of that was was a seamless transition. He said a lot of missionaries he's always he's talked to. They say transitioning from the field back to furlough and back and forth can be a stressful time because um, a lot of things can happen, especially in today's day and age. Um, you know, during the uh, early days of, the, uh, of COVID and the pandemic, a lot of missionaries, when they came back on furlough, 
they weren't able to get back out on the field or they couldn't come back on furlough and things like that. And so moving forward, when you go through that transition time, there's a lot more things to consider and a lot, a lot of things that uh, can go wrong. But he praises the Lord that there was zero issues in that. And um, so he asks that we be in prayer as they go, as they continue this furlough and they try to um, raise some more support and just be an encouragement to, to pastors and churches that they visit and to reach the lost. They do um, rejoice. One last thing in here is that their, that their youngest daughter did get, or not their youngest daughter, but their, uh, one of their daughters did get saved in a vacation Bible school they weren't a part of. And uh, he rejoices in that and says he's never been more proud as a father um, to see his daughter accept Jesus Christ as her savior. So remember the Gerwitz family, missionaries to Brazil as they travel and try to raise some more support. Thank you. Amen. Fellas, if you'd come, we're going to take the offering. And uh, that's all right. David slacked on his job, but that's okay. <clears throat> you guys come on down. We'll ask the Lord to bless the offering. Ryan, would you ask the Lord to bless the offering? Brother, you had asked me uh, to come up, uh, a couple weeks ago he asked me to come up and just uh, give my testimony. You know, we've been doing that uh, several Sunday nights in a row, and uh, somebody actually asked me a couple of weeks ago, said, well, when are you going to give yours? I'm like, I don't know. I've done it before. I don't know. But uh, then he asked me, so for the, for, the, for the one that asked, here I am giving my testimony. So uh, 2009 um, is when we came here. Um, I had, my in-laws had started coming uh, 2008, um, I believe so. And uh, um, so I'd met Preacher a couple of times at their house, uh, running to him at the grocery store, whatever the case may be. And uh, in 2009, um, Angie and I started having some trouble with um, our then 15-year-old daughter. And um, uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that whatever I was doing, whatever my opinion was, that wasn't working. So I needed an, I needed an outside shot. I, need, I needed an opinion from somebody um, that perhaps didn't think like I did. And I'd, again, I'd met Preacher a couple of times, um, seemed like a solid guy, seemed like a genuine guy. So um, we had visited the, excuse me, we had visited the church a couple of times <clears throat> and uh, just for special days, things of that nature. And so I decided to dip in one Sunday and, and uh, talk to Preacher after church. And I was like, man, I'd like to, I'd like to catch up with you. Um, I'd like to talk to you about something. He said, absolutely. He said, I'll holler at you later this week. You stop by. And, uh, and we'll catch up. So he gave me a call later that week, said, how about Thursday? I'm like, sounds good, I'll stop in, I'll stop in um, after work. And uh, so we sat down, we talked. Um, I discussed some of the challenges that uh, we were dealing with. And one of the things that made a big impression on me, and I think was very helpful to a guy like me, is that um, what, whatever my question was, whatever, I asked preacher about what, whatever the case may be. He constantly he didn't say, "Well, David, um, I think you need to do this, and here's my opinion on that, and here's how you handle this." He every question I had, he went straight to the Word of God, and he said, "Well, the Word of God says this, and let's look here, and let's look at this, let's look at this section, let's look at these verses." And um, I was raised Catholic. I missed that part. Um, I was raised Catholic. My mother still goes to the church. She's been at for. 
probably close to 50 years. Um, um, I quit going to church when um, I was too big enough for my mother to physically drag me to church anymore. I was about 14-ish, I would say. And uh, so I'd, I'd, I had had a head knowledge that the Bible was the Word of God. I had, a, I had an understanding of that. I had at least accepted that. I wasn't saved, but I had accepted at least that. So when preacher, when preacher approached my problems, from the standpoint that he did, I thought, or it was, it was easier for me to go, well, okay, if that's what it says, that's what it says. I mean, I hadn't cracked the Bible since I was 14, but I'm like, well, if that's what it says, that, that makes sense to me. So, um, so he, oddly enough, Vacation Bible School was coming up, literally, I think, within a week or two, and he said, well, are you going to bring the kids to Vacation Bible School? And I'm like, I don't know, I might, you know, I'll see. I'll see what the wife says and whatnot, and... Uh, um, the, my wife hates when I say this. She hates it. Uh, she, she despises when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, she, uh, she was like, I, I don't know. I don't know anybody there, you know, what, whatever the case may be. And the kids, the boys weren't totally into it. They're like, I don't know, you know, and they were eight, nine, nine, ten, something like that. I'd have to do the math, but, uh, I'm like, well, preachers, you know, brother Corey seemed to think it'd be a good idea. So we might as, we might as well go. Uh, but one thing he said to me that very first time we met, and again, I didn't get saved in that, in that meeting, um, but the very first time we met, again, it was something that was very helpful to me. It's impressive how the, how the Lord uses people um, when they talk to different people. He seen, the Lord seems to give people the right words to say that that person needs to hear, so to speak. You, you know what I mean? He made this statement to me, and it's, it has helped me for years at this point when, when I disagree with something or when I don't like something or I have a frustration or whatever the case may be. He made this statement to me. He said, David, you and I are both men. We're not always going to agree on everything, but that's no reason not to have your family in church. And I know that's very bottom shelf and that's very simple, but for a guy like me who likes to argue, I'm like, fair enough. You can't really argue with that. So we came to vacation Bible school, um, decided that this is what we're gonna I decided this is what we're gonna do as a family. We're we're gonna start going to church. And this is the part my wife hates hates for me to say. She made the she made the comment. She said, Well, I don't mind going to church on Sunday mornings, but I'm not gonna be one of those people that goes, you know, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm I'm not gonna do that. And and my response to her was, What we're doing's not working. That's a fact. If we're gonna go to church, we might as well go and get all we can out of it. You know, that, that, that seemed like we, what we were going to do, or that seemed like what we needed to do. And uh, so since then, a couple months later, um, I'll try to be quick, a couple months later, uh, Preacher and Brother Glenn came by and visited on a Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, and we sat in our living room. And, uh, um, you know, they, they, gave, they gave the gospel. My wife got saved. Um, we talked a little bit. I, I thought I'd been saved when I was a kid. Um, so my wife got saved in my living room that, that Saturday morning with Preacher and Brother Glenn sitting there. And uh, so then Preacher's like, you want to get baptized tomorrow morning? We're like, sure, sounds great, let's do it. And uh, um, so as we you know, went on about our day, went to bed that night, and I, I couldn't sleep, the Lord wouldn't give me peace. He wouldn't let me sleep. And, he, and I remember it plain as day, and you know what I mean. It's not an audible voice, but he was, he was clearly saying to me, he said, David, going under that water is not going to do you a bit of good if you ain't saved. It's not going to do any good. So I didn't sleep. I wrestled with it all night. Six o'clock that Sunday morning, I got up, living room, in living room by myself, got, got on my knees, got saved right there in my living room that next morning. And uh, here we are all these years later. Um, you see my boys serving around here. Um, you see us plugged in in, uh, in different places. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how we got where we are today. One, one other thing I learned... Um, was that that conversation, that original conversation with the preacher and the changes we made in our life did not fix the problem at hand that I had come to him to see, so to speak. You, you, you know what I mean? My daughter still made choices, and to this day she is living those same choices. However, it had a tremendous difference in my family. Uh, trusting the Lord as, our savior, as my Savior, I've seen my family, I've seen my, again, I saw my wife saved, I've seen my boys saved, you see my boys serving around here, um, and preacher, preacher made a comment to me, and I've said it a bunch of times, he made a comment to me after I got saved, 
Um, again, it was, it was a few weeks later after I'd gotten saved and we were sitting in the office talking because I would stop by after work just to, just to see what was going on, just to talk to him about stuff. And uh, he made this comment to me right after I got saved. He said, if you think the devil's been rough on you before, he's fixing to get real rough on you. And he wasn't saying that to be ugly to me. He wasn't saying that to discourage me. He was saying that as a warning to me. And boy, was he right. Boy, was he right. But he, he also told me, he said, you just grab hold of the Lord. You be in your Bible. You be in church. You be faithful. You do what the Lord has you to do. And, and, and the, Lord, the Lord will be with you as you go through the struggles that are coming. And uh, again, all these years later, 12, 13, 13 years later, I'd have to do the math about 13 years later. Here we are, and uh, so that's my testimony. Thank you all. Thank you, Brother Hannah. Those are good to hear. It's good to hear salvation testimony. It's good to hear that the church is involved in getting people into church and seeing lives changed, not by what we do, but by the power of the gospel has affected you. Grab your psalm books and stand. We'll sing 287, Look to the Lamb of God. 287. Bibles turn to Acts chapter number 9, Acts chapter number 9, and I appreciate that message from Brother Hewitt this morning, and uh, if you weren't able to be here, I'd go back and listen to it, it'd be a help to you, Acts chapter number 9, and uh, uh, we'll read several verses, all right, so Acts chapter number 9, several verses that we'll read, and uh, Acts chapter number 9, let's start in verse number 1, the Bible says, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul Saul why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, 
and hath seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized I'm going to ask brother Steve Rushing if you'd lift your voice and ask the Lord to bless the message tonight Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. The passage uh, that we've read is Saul's conversion account. Saul, uh, we uh, would know and we could say that he was the uh, arch persecutor of Christians uh, as he would go about arresting Christians and casting them into prison and disrupting Christianity uh, all that he could. Uh, he hated men and women that professed to be Christians. And uh, we would know if you've been in church any time at all, you would know that Saul's name would change to that of Paul. And by the end of Paul's life, uh, he is considered by many to be one of, if not the greatest uh, Christian uh, or servant, I should say, uh, to walk upon the earth. Uh, God used him in a mighty way. Uh, you know that God uh, used Paul to go on uh, three different missionary trips which God used him in a mighty way to see thousands of folks trust Christ as Savior, to see cities and even countries turned upside down for the cause of Christ. Let me just say, not because of uh, Paul's own doings, but because of what God did through him. Second, or first Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 10 Paul acknowledges that he says this he said but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was with me we could say if you will that Paul uh, was or Paul is uh, the model Christian uh, for every one of us to follow when it comes to a life for God. Uh, as Paul nears the end of his life, uh, you will remember that Paul penned uh, one of the most famous verses that we uh, would know, one that we would learn uh, as a young child. He would pen 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7, and you can quote it probably. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And let me just say there are many Christians uh, who would think within themselves, uh, uh, boy, I, I sure would like for God to use me as God used Paul. As you look over Paul's life and you see all that God did in Paul's life, it's easy for us as Christians to look at that and, uh, and to say, man, I sure wish God would use me in that fashion. I sure wish that God would let me reach folks the way that Paul did I sure wish that God would let me make a difference uh, uh, in this world before my end comes like Paul did I sure wish that uh, God would work mightily through me and we can agree that God worked mightily in the life of Paul uh, many would say boy I, I sure wish that uh, God would let me uh, uh, have the impact if you will that Paul did uh, as Paul uh, was used 
used uh, to reach many, as I've already mentioned, thousands upon thousands uh, that Paul would have influenced. And, and uh, uh, those that uh, would say, man, I sure wish God would give me the plan that God gave Paul. I sure wish I had the plan that God had for Paul. And can I say this? Uh, uh, there was nothing special, super special about Paul. Paul was a man just like I am. Paul was a man just like those of you men that sit in this room tonight. Uh, the difference is that uh, God had a plan for Paul and Paul simply followed the plan that God had for him. Paul wasn't anything special. Let me say this. Uh, you can have the plan that God had for Paul. God's plan for Paul really uh, was a very simple plan. Tonight's message, let me just go ahead and, and uh, uh, put this in right now. Uh, tonight's message, it won't be anything deep. Maybe you came to church tonight and you're uh, hoping that, man, the Word of God will be opened and, man, uh, I'll see something that I've never seen before. Can I tell you right now, if that's what you came for, boy, you came for the wrong reason. I want to preach to you a very simple message tonight on this thought. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. The message tonight will be uh, as basic as learning the ABCs. You'll remember uh, as you uh, went into school there in kindergarten, uh, as you learned those ABCs, some of you maybe before that, tonight's message will be that basic. One thing I've learned uh, in ministry, I've been in ministry a uh, super long time, but one of the things that I have learned in the time that I've been in ministry is this. The average person uh, isn't in need of uh, the meat if I can say that, of the Word. Uh, there are many of us that uh, we think, boy, I'm ready for the meat. I hope the preacher opens the Bible and turns over some stone that, that never has been turned over. Or maybe you're under the uh, mindset of, uh, uh, boy, I hope that the, that the preacher shows me something I've never seen before. But can I tell you, uh, most of us, uh, uh, we're not ready for the meat. We haven't even learned to drink the milk of the Word. Uh, most of us, we've not learned uh, what it is to take those basic things of the Word of God and to abide by them. And can I say to you, uh, we as Christians, uh, we just need to get back to the basics. Tonight's message will be that simple. Paul was able to be used uh, mightily by the hand of God by following really just the basic things of God. There was nothing special that Paul followed. There wasn't some secret uh, plan that God had for Paul that God was able to use Paul in a great and mighty way. No, the same plan that God provides for you and I is the same plan that Paul followed in order to be used mightily by God. And let me just say this, uh, God's mighty work through the life of Paul, and I'll give them to you quickly. Number one, uh, started with a call to salvation. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. It started with a call to salvation. Look back at chapter 9 of Acts and verse number 3. Notice as the Bible says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Verse number 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse number 6, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul's on the road to Damascus. He's headed to persecute more Christians. He's headed to find some more uh, that profess Jesus Christ, to cast them into prison. He's headed to Damascus to wreak more havoc upon the church, if you will. Paul's on the road to Damascus and he's journeying uh, to Damascus and all of a sudden uh, that bright light from heaven shines down and it smites Paul to the ground. We read that. We read the Word of God and we see how that God used Paul and we see the end result of Paul. We see the, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. But may I remind you that Paul didn't start with three missionary trips under his belt. Paul didn't start with uh, seeing thousands that would trust Christ as their Savior. 
Paul didn't start with uh, making a difference in cities and countries around the globe. Let me say, uh, if God is ever going to do a mighty work through us, it's going to start just as it did with Paul with that matter of salvation. It's going to start just as it did with him. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. We see a call to salvation. Just as God had a call for salvation to Paul, let me just remind you, God has the same call to everyone. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 17. You know the verse. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will. Let him take of the water of life freely. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. He says this. He says, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Let me just say this. And I, I know where we're at tonight. I know we're in a Baptist church. I know that this is a Sunday night crowd. I understand that. But may I tell you friend. Hey, uh, salvation is not just for a Sunday morning bus church. Salvation is, is not just in Sunday school. Hey, friend, listen to me. Um, boy, I know numerous people that got saved in a Sunday night church service. Salvation is good all of the time. And can I say to you, God's desire and God's plan for all is that of salvation. Maybe there's somebody here tonight under the sound of my voice. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've heard the gospel uh, numerous times. Maybe this is the first time that you've heard the gospel. But can I say to you, friend, hey, listen, salvation is for all. I'm glad tonight that just as God would reach down and save Paul, he'll reach down and he'll save anybody. Salvation, my friend, uh, can I say, uh, and we know this, and we would say amen to this, but uh, I'm glad that it's not reserved for any particular group. I'm glad that salvation is not reserved for any particular race. Hey, listen, friend, I'm glad that salvation uh, is not reserved for any nationality, any specific nationality or any specific gender. Listen, salvation is free for all, and it's available to all. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. He desires that all would be saved. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Notice the verses say this. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. God wants everybody to be saved, friend. John chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, we would know this verse. The Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world... Through him might be saved. It's God's plan for everyone to be saved. Uh, Paul, boy we see the great and mighty work that God did through him. But can I say to you, Paul was just following God's plan. God's plan was first of all a call to salvation. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse number 9 the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Where, boy aren't you glad God's long suffering? I don't know about you, but I had many a chance to get saved. But it wasn't until I was a 21-year-old young man that the Lord pricked my heart and showed me my need for salvation and I truly got born again. He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. You say, well, Brother Nichols, what about the drunk down at the bar? Brother Nichols, what about the murderer down there on death row? Listen, friend, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And by the way, let me just say this. I'm no different than that murderer down there on death row. You're no different than that drunk sitting there on that bar stool. You're no different than that wicked one that's out uh, running skid row tonight. Friend, I'm no different than them. Let me say it doesn't matter who you are under the sound of my voice tonight. If you've never settled your eternity, can I say this? God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. Oh, listen, friend, uh, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, you can settle that tonight. Can I say, uh, I know what the mindset of Many a Christian would be on a Sunday night 
She would come to church. It would, it, many would think the thought in their mind, boy, who in the world does this guy think he's talking to? I mean, it's a Sunday night crowd. I mean, what does he think he's down on the street corner uh, preaching to some reprobates? I mean, where does this fellow think he is? Is he in a jail preaching to some uh, guy that's committed uh, some crime? I mean, who is this guy talking to? Does he think he's in some Muslim country? No, listen, friend. I know exactly where I stand. And let me just say this. Wouldn't be the first time that somebody that maybe had gone through the motions of salvation realized for the very first time, hey, you know what? I don't truly know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Wouldn't be the first time that uh, somebody stepped out that professed to be saved yet truly got born again. Can I say, um, Brother Hewitt uh, alluded to some of it this morning. I've, I've seen people in Bible college that you know what, boy, they... The Lord maybe had called them to preach, they thought. And got in Bible college and realized, boy, uh, you know what? I don't even know Jesus is my Savior. I need to get that settled. There have been many uh, uh, that, have, uh, that have walked that walk. I could take you to uh, those that were serving in ministry and those that were faithful to church and uh, even preachers' wives that sat under the preaching that, uh, you know what, they went through the motions but never had trusted Christ truly is their Savior. Can I remind you tonight, it's not murderers that go to hell. Listen, can I remind you tonight that it's not the queers that go to hell. It's not drunks that go to hell. It's not the abortion crowd that goes to hell. It's not the wicked child molester that goes to hell. Hey, listen, it's those without Jesus Christ that go to hell. Why would you preach a message about salvation on a Sunday night? Well, I can tell you this. I had a young boy that got saved a few weeks ago on a Sunday night through the preaching about salvation. Can I say this? Uh, you can do whatever you want to. You can stand on your head. You can recite the Romans road frontwards, backwards, every which way. That doesn't grant you heaven, friend. John chapter 1 and verse number 12, the Bible says this, but as many as received him. As many as received him, and those that received Jesus, and those are the ones that are granted salvation. He says as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I know there's some here that, boy, you're ready to get to supper already maybe. And you're curious, man, why is this guy uh, ranting and raving about salvation? Uh, what's the big deal about salvation? Why would you preach on a Sunday night about salvation? A matter that should have already been settled. Well, I'll tell you why. Because of this, friend. If you miss salvation, you've missed it all. If I miss salvation, I've missed everything. Nothing else matters. Listen, teenager, man, woman, listen. It doesn't matter who you are here tonight. Listen, if you don't have it settled, the matter of salvation, can I urge you, boy, get it settled before it's too late. God's plan for Paul wasn't some great plan. Was it some mysterious plan that nobody else uh, would ever see? No, it's the same plan that God has for your life. It's the same plan that God has for my life. And first of all, it's a call to salvation. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. We see, first of all, the call for salvation. I want you to see, second of all, in verse number 6, Acts chapter number 9, is a call for surrender. A call for salvation. Secondly, we see a call for surrender. Look at it with me. Some of you already think you're ahead of me, but it's not going to be uh, probably exactly where you're thinking it's going. All right, but we'll get there in a minute. Call for surrender, verse number 6. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I think that simultaneously Paul gets saved and he surrenders. He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It's an act of surrender. I believe that uh, uh, it shows us that right there in the scripture. And can I say this? It's God's plan, just as it, as it was with Paul, that every believer lives a life of surrender. That's God's plan. 
God's plan for Paul for salvation, hey, that's God's plan for all. But let me say, God's plan for Paul with surrender is God's plan for all. Hey, the Bible tells us in James chapter number 4 and verse number 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. We like to quote that last part, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Or resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Submit yourselves to God, the Bible says. Romans 12, verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, here's the surrender, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Surrender. God, here I am. God, I'm emptying myself out. And God, I'm offering myself to you. Let me just say, the mighty work that God did through Paul, it began with salvation. But it continued in Paul's life as he surrendered himself to God. Can I say if you and I are going to see God work through us, and by the way, I want God to work through me. I hope that you do. If I'm going to see God work through me, uh, as he did in the life of Paul, it must follow the same pattern, a life of surrender. The word surrender, it carries the definition of to yield to the power of another. To yield to the power of another. Someone best describes surrender as uh, God's will becomes my will. I say, God, forget what I want. God, I want what you want. That's a description of surrender. Following God's will instead of my will. I like to describe it as this. What God has shown me in this book, I'll follow it. What he's shown me through the preaching. Through my personal devotions. What he's shown me there, God, you know what? I'm going to follow that. And then as God continues to show me things, I say, all right, God, I'm going to follow that too. That's surrender, friend. Uh, you see, um, there are those that get nervous about this area of surrender. When you bring up surrendering, uh, many people start squirming in their pews. Why? Uh, most have the idea that if I surrender to God, well, I'm, I'm signing the list to say, hey, I'm going to uproot my family and I'm going to move across the country. That's not particularly uh, all that surrender is, friend. Listen, many were get afraid of surrender because uh, they may be afraid that God's going to call them to preach. If you're a young man, many will be afraid of, the, uh, of this area of surrender uh, because they may feel that uh, God wants me to go across the seas and be a missionary. Many may be afraid of surrender because they're afraid that God may call me into some ministry where my, where my family is going to starve to death. And can I say to you, uh, that is an area of surrender, but that's an area of surrender that's specific. I'm not even going to get on that tonight. I just want to talk about basic surrender. General surrender. I'm talking about uh, uh, what God uh, expects from every Christian. You understand, uh, before uh, Paul's conversion, he was acting under the commission of the Sanhedrin to persecute, to kill, to disrupt uh, to, to wreak havoc on Christians. Now as a believer, uh, Paul would act under the commission of God. Lord, what will thou have me to do? He said. What will thou have me to do? Uh, surrendering his will uh, to God's will. It would be as Paul would say, Okay, God, uh, you want me to be a servant of yours? That's what I'll do. All right, God, uh, you want me to be a witness? That's what I'll do. Okay, God, uh, you want me to live a life for you? That's what I'll do. Okay, God, uh, uh, you want me to and you fill in the blank. Paul was now placing himself under the commission of God. What I'm trying to say is this tonight, friend. Paul's being used mightily by God. Uh, it didn't begin with the missionary trips. Uh, sitting in a jail cell and watching God uh, cause an earthquake that would break the bands and allow him to uh, see the uh, jailer trust Christ or working through him in the, uh, in the city of Ephesus or Philippi or any of those that he would have went to and was able to reach. It began with him putting one foot in front of the other in the basic surrender 
to God. What I'm afraid of is many of us were looking for some uh, great revelation of God's will for our life, yet we can't uh, follow the basic surrender in our lives. The only way, let me say this, that I'll ever be used of God, the only way that you'll ever be used of God, the way that Paul was used of God is going to be uh, by beginning with the basic surrender in our lives. Listen, let's not deceive ourselves here tonight, friend. Listen, there, there are those that, that sit here tonight. I know, uh, I know how I am. You know how you are. And those around us know how we are. So let's not deceive ourselves. We're in church. We're in church so that God can speak to our hearts and so that we can make changes so that God can use us as mightily as Paul. Let's not act as if we are surrendered to God. Listen, if we're not passing out gospel tracts faithfully. Listen, God commands us, hey, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's a basic command to Christians. Let's not sit here with our halos on tonight and act as if we're totally surrendered to God's will for our life if we're not faithful to pass out tracts, if we're not faithful to open God's word and to read it and to study it and to find out God what is it that you want to speak to me about if we never witness for Christ listen friend there are many that we come to church listen we put on the front we come to church and we paint ourselves to be surrendered to God's will we paint ourselves to be in the center of God's will but we never witness for Christ hey if I'm ever going to be used as mightily as God used Paul. Hey, I'm going to have to begin to follow those basic commands that God gives me. If I don't spend time in prayer, hey, listen to me, friend. I'm not surrendered to God. Listen, if you're not giving to the local church, tithes and offerings, hey, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, you're not surrendered to God. I hate to burst your bubble. You may think tonight that you are surrendered. And I may think tonight that I am surrendered. But can I tell you, if I'm not separated, totally separated from the ungodly crowd, I'm not surrendered to God. If I'm not living a, and practicing a personal holiness in my life, hey, I'm not surrendered to God. Paul was able to see God use him in a mighty way. He was able to see thousands saved. He was able to turn cities upside down for the cause of Christ. Why? Because he was surrendered. Those basic things, those basic steps of the Christian life. Can I say to you, listen, uh, it's not important what God's uh, specific will in your life is if you're not following God's basic will. Listen, friend, by the way, I believe this. I don't believe that God shows you that specific will if you're not following the basic will. How does God speak to me through His Word? Through that basic surrender of reading God's Word, study to show thyself approved unto God. Hey, listen, God can't show me His specific will if I'm not following that basic will. There are those that oh, will make decisions and, and claim that, oh, well, it's God's will. Is it God's will? I'd say this, uh, if I'm not following God's basic will for my life, for any Christian, I would wonder, is it God's will for my life? I could go on and on and list numerous different things uh, as examples of, uh, of basic surrender to God in my life. And I say to you, uh, if we're not following those basic commands of Scripture, we're not surrendered to God. Those that are concerned about some great revelation, as I said a moment ago, when we ought to be concerned about just following the basics. Hey, you know what would be good for Christians today? Just to get back to the basics. Just to get back to the basic things in the Word of God. Just to get back to those things that God's already shown us in His Word. And say, God, you know what? I'm not worried about that big wheel out there, uh, whether you're calling me to preach or whether you're calling me to do this or that. God, I just want to surrender to follow you in reading your word, in walking with you, in being a faithful witness, in being in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, those basic areas of the Christian life. Can I say to you, my heart would transform 
our churches. It would transform our homes. It would transform uh, the city that we live in. It would transform uh, this country. It would transform our world if Christians followed God's plan for surrender. Just basic surrender. D.L. Moody said this, The world's yet to see what God can do with a man who is fully surrendered to God. Oh, what God could do if we just follow his plan. Hey, can I tell you? God was able to do great and mighty things through Paul. Not because of some special plan. Because Paul said, all right, God, you want me to go serve you? That's what I'll do. All right, God, you want me to preach? That's what I'll do. All right, God, you want me to be a witness? That's what I'll do. He followed those very basic steps that God put in front of him. And as God revealed more to him, he said, all right, God, I'm surrendered. I'll follow it. My, if Christians would get back to that plan. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. We see that in a call to salvation. We see uh, the call to surrender. Let me give you last of all, and I see the time we'll be moving. Let me show you a call to service. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. It's a simple plan. I just need to follow it. It's a call to salvation. If you're not saved tonight, listen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, man, listen, I can't make it any more plain. You need to get saved. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Listen, friend, don't wait another minute. Uh, God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. It's a call to surrender. Hey, listen, don't worry about that uh, big uh, surrender in your life. We're about the basic surrender. Let's just follow the ABCs, if you will. And then last of all, I see a call to service. Look at chapter 9, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And notice, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. God began his mighty work through Paul. In his call for salvation. That work continued uh, through God's call for Paul to surrender. And we see the completion of God's work through this call for service. Let me just say this. Uh, I, I'm going to bring the plane in uh, to lower altitude and get ready for a landing. All right, uh, But let me just say, God, uh, God called Paul to serve him, but God calls each one of us to serve him. There's not some Christians that God says, all right, I want you to serve me. And others that he says, all right, you're on your own. You do your own thing. No, God calls all of us to serve us. Uh, go, uh, you look at James chapter number 1 and verse number 22. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Psalm 100, we uh, used to quote that chapter by memory in Sunday school but it begins saying make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands verse number 2 he says this serve the Lord with gladness uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12 wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can I say it's God's plan for every part of the body of Christ to be serving Him. And by the way, uh, if you're saved here tonight, you're a part of the body of Christ. And it's God's plan that I find some place of service to be serving Him. As God calls Paul to serve Him, I want you to notice the scripture, verse number 8. Notice what it says. First three words, I want you to read them with me. You ready? Here we go. And Saul arose. And Saul arose, verse number 8, chapter number 9 of Acts. And Saul arose, the Bible says. God called Saul. He says, Saul, uh, man, I've got a task for you. He says, Saul, uh, I want to save you. I want you to surrender to me. But Saul, I want you to put, it, put, I want to put you in my service. And let me just say, God worked mightily through the life of Paul because he answered God's call to service. You want to see God work mightily in your life? If I want to see God work mightily in my life, hey, listen, I must be just like Paul. I must surrender to that call for service that God has for me. Can I say right up next to surrender is this word service that most Christians get nervous about. They get nervous about those two. 
When the preacher says, all right, you ought to surrender to God, man. Oh, no. And then when the preacher says, you ought to be serving him. Those two words, but can I say this? We ought to be willing vessels to serve God. Paul was a willing vessel. Paul didn't try to fight the call that God had for his life. Paul didn't try to say, well, God, there's somebody else that can do a better job than I can. He didn't say, God, uh, well, I just got saved. God, you know I can't serve you. I can't do anything. I don't even know anything. No, it's sadly today we ought to be willing vessels. But many a Christian makes every excuse for not doing the Lord's work. Listen, friend. God still calls us. Can I say God can't use us in a great way like he did Paul until we are, real, are willing like Paul did to arise? There's many a Christian that you know what you need to do. Maybe you're saved here tonight. Maybe you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Maybe, you know what, you are surrendered uh, to God. You read your Bible. You follow those basic things of the Scripture. But you know what, you're not serving. Can I say there are many Christians that just need to arise like Paul did. Need to get up and get going. I'm not asking you, listen friend, to teach a Sunday school class. I'm not asking you uh, necessarily to drive a bus or to teach bus church or to sing in the choir. Or, or any of those things listen uh, maybe you would just look around you and uh, uh, and you would say you know what man nobody's filling the track rack out there I can do that listen maybe you'd just look around you and you'd you'd say you know what man uh, nobody comes through after the services and straightens the books up in the book racks but you know what I can do that I can't do much I can't teach a Sunday school class and I can't drive a bus and I don't know how to teach those kids in bus church nor do I want to but I can straighten those books up Maybe you'd look around and you would say, man, you know what, I can't do those things, but I can wash the baptistry robes. Hey, somebody's got to do it, friend. Somebody's got to do it. Maybe you say, I can fill the water for the preacher. And maybe you would say, I can pick up trash after the service. Or I can fold bulletins. Or I can uh, stock supplies. Or whatever the case may be, friend. But can I say this? God calls all of us to service. God's plan for Paul is God's plan for all. We see that in the call for salvation. We see that in the call for surrender. We see that in the call for service. Can I say this? The Christian life is wrapped up in these three basic simple areas. It's Christian life. Saved, surrendered, and serving. That's the Christian life. It's not some great big plan. It's wrapped up in these three basic areas. Uh, God uses me just as it was in the life of Paul, or his use of me, I should say. As it was in the life of Paul is subjective to my response to these calls in my life. In every one of our lives, listen, there's a call for salvation. If you're not saved, you need to get it settled. Maybe you doubt your salvation. Maybe you can't go back to a place in time of, man, I accepted Christ. That's when it was. I know that time. I know that place. I may not know the date. I may not know if it was raining outside or whatever. But I know that there was a difference in my life. I accepted Christ as my Savior. There's a call for salvation. There's a call for surrender. Christian, can I say tonight, boy, don't worry about the big surrender if you will. What about those basic things? Man, let's surrender to God. Let me follow those things that you've already showed me. What you've already given me in the scripture, I'm going to follow those. And God, as you show me other things, God, I'm going to follow those as well. Can I say that's what we need to get back to? And then last of all, there's a call for service. Boy, where, where are you serving in the local church? There's something for you to do. I'll say that. God never intended for the work of the church to be done by a select few. No, it's the body of Christ. The Bible says there's hands, there's feet, there's ears and mouths and noses. And man, all of those work together to make the body of Christ function the way that God intends for it to function. Where are you at tonight, Christian? God wants to work mightily through me. God wants to work mightily through you. But can I say this? 
God only can as I follow this plan as Paul followed it. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for your many blessings, God. Thank you for loving us. God, thank you for being willing, God, to use us. Lord, as unworthy vessels, God, as we look at Paul, God, and Lord, I'm grateful that, uh, Lord, you use any of us if we're submitted to you, God. You, uh, Lord, you want to use us. God, thank you that, Lord, you offer salvation to all. Lord, it's not restricted to a select group, but God, it's available to all. Father, very basic message tonight, but God, many times that's what we need. We just need basics, God. We just need to learn to follow those things that, God, you've given us already. And, Lord, uh, uh, and when we can learn to follow those, God, then you give us more. And so, God, I pray that however you might have spoken to the hearts of those here tonight, Lord, that we would respond accordingly, God. I want to ask you real quick, I wonder how God might have spoken to your heart tonight. Let me ask you this. Are you following God's plan? A very simple plan that I laid out to you tonight. Have you received Christ as your Savior, that call for salvation? Are you living a life that is surrendered to God? I'm not talking about uh, the, the big things in life. I'm talking about the basic things. And then last of all, are you serving? I want you to think about that. As God has spoken to your heart here in just a moment, whenever the invitation begins, I, I want you to, don't sit there in your seat, listen. There's no use in us pretending, hey, we all fail. We're, none of us are where we ought to be. But you know what? We won't get to where we need to be if we don't respond when the Lord speaks to us. Lord, I pray you'd bless the invitation. Use it, Lord God. Help us to do what you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As